This podcast contains content that is graphic in nature and mature language that may be unsuitable for children or young listeners. Listener discretion is advised. A non-emergency call came in to Concordia Parish Sheriff's Office at approximately 2.55 a.m. on March 14, 2007. A mail caller stated that someone had broken into his home and shot his parents, and he thought his parents were dead. The caller informed the employee at Concordia Parish Sheriff's Office that he had shot the intruder, but he thought the intruder may still be alive. The operator contacted the Verity Police Department and provided the information to a sergeant and the 911 dispatcher. Once the operator returned to the line, the mail caller stated that he shot the intruder again, and the intruder was now dead. Come with us as we take a wild ride through the intricacies of this case on this episode of Sentinel. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Sin Law. I'm Kelly. And I'm Kyler. And we are going to tell you a story. No. You are going to tell the story. I'm going to tell you a story. And Kyler, he's going to be you, the audience. And he's going to, he's never heard this story before. So he'll be reacting and asking questions and we'll see how it goes. So let's get started. John and Geraldine Wood, Geraldine went by Jerry, they lived together with their son, Connor Lane Wood, in Faraday, Louisiana. The population, according to the U.S. Census Bureau in 2007, was around 1,580 people. The family lived in somewhat, uh, some people referenced as an upscale area with Faraday, and considering the fact that there's barely 4,000 people, calling upscale is, you know, just not country bumpkin, I guess. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think so. Um, they did live near the private Delta Charter School in Faraday. John Wood was a farmer, and he routinely worked every week out of the parish, and he would leave Sunday evening and return Friday evening. He was gone Monday through Friday and was home on weekends. Mary Wood was a full-time homemaker, and she homeschooled her son, 15-year-old Connor Wood. As she had, her older son ran a very religious homeschools curriculum well as her household and older brother of connor who had already graduated and was attending college in ruston louisiana on the night of this occurrence which happened to be a wednesday night though it was in the middle of the week on Mary and connor were all at home it's a little unusual because normally like i said john would be out of the parish what i gathered from the court documents it stated that john would have come home tuesday night due to a water Problem or issue, something had happened. He was at work and their water had got shut off, so he came home midweek. So, for those of you that are unfamiliar with uh, Louisiana, Parish is essentially a county. Every other state in the United States calls them county, yeah. Louisiana is the only one that still uses parishes, so if that was confusing. But, the more you know. <laughs> exactly. So, like I said, the call. To 911, the 911 operator was actually on a non-emergency line, so they directly called the sheriff's office. Came in around 2:55 a.m. on Wednesday, March 14th. Now, I've seen varying reports of the conversation because Connor did call the non-emergent line, so the call was not recorded. Did happen to record though the, the conversations or the um, radio transmissions between the officers that were dispatched to the scene. Have that as a loose record of what the dispatcher was telling them had the actual 911 call and that comes into play and is important for later. According to Connor's statement, he told the operator that he was in his bed in his room when he heard two gunshots. He freaked out and he went to his parents' room to retrieve a weapon. When he exited his parents' room and was back in the hallway, he came face to face with the intruder, air quotes. (laughs) He shot him. (laughs) We're not, you cannot do air quotes. I'm going to do air quotes because it's intruder. I guess you can hear it when I say it. Or you could just <laughs> let them uh, not know that it's intruder. an intruder. <laughs> until they find out. Right. Um, better yet, unquote. He met the intruder face to face and he shot him. And the intruder was on the ground but still moving and still had the gun near his hand. Or believed it still had bullets in it. So he asked the operator three different times if he could kill him. According to Connor, in his version... The operator, after the third time, said, yes, you can kill him. Probably just because he was a little bit tired of him asking. <laughs> Maybe. But, you know, anybody that knows or has ever listened to a 911 call, I have never heard a dispatcher say, yeah, go ahead, kill them. 
He didn't call 911. It wasn't the dispatcher. He called the sheriff directly. And it would be more likely for the sheriff than it would be for the dispatcher, dispatcher to tell someone that go ahead. Well, the operator denies ever having said, like, I told him nothing of the sort. But since we have no reporting, there is no 100% way. It's basically the version against the operator's version. Yeah, if I was the operator, I would say, I would tell them that I didn't say that either. Right, exactly. Especially not once we get the facts of the case. So after getting this call, the dispatch officers arrive at the home in Faraday. And when they arrive, they see Connor on his cell phone coming out of the front door of the home. Immediately, they get him into the patrol car for his safety. And then they go inside to clear the house of any potential threats. What they see inside is tragic and very unexpected. They notice that the back door was open and a window in the door was shattered. But only the outer pane of the glass was broken. How do you mean the outer pane? I got out of the court documents that I saw. There wasn't a whole lot to explain it. Just literally the exact words were the outer pane of the glass. So I would assume that it was like a double pane window type. So I'm not entirely sure. Um, It may very well be a portion of the glass was broken. Just like the outer, like the outer section. They noticed that. They also noticed that there is a hoodie has shattered glass in and around it that's laying beside the back door. They also notice a hammer on the bar stool near the glass door in the kitchen and a 9mm pistol on the bar between the refrigerator and the entrance to the dining room. It still had a round in the chamber and several in the magazine. They continue to the hallway and they find a body, but instead of some masked intruder they were led to believe had entered the house and killed the poor kid's parents, they find a 16-year-old child, a male, laying face down in the hallway with multiple bullet wounds. Now, obviously, they don't know he's 16 years old at the time, but they can tell he's a teenage boy. He's laying in the hallway with multiple bullet wounds. He's obviously dead, but the officers curiously noticed that he had camouflage neoprene gloves on his hands and some kind of, like, ace bandage wrapped around his leg. Later testified to and determined by a forensic pathologist that... This victim had been shot a total of nine times. Seven times with a 32 caliber weapon and twice with a 22 caliber weapon. Didn't you say that there was only a 22 found on the bar? Nine millimeters so far. Uh-huh. Nine millimeters so far. Further in, they find the bodies of John and Jerry Wood. They're still in bed with the covers over them and blood and bullet casings everywhere. Once the police clear the home of any potential threat, they call the coroner in and the investigators to come and process the scene. And they take Connor to the police station to do an interview. Except they can't because... He's underage. That's right. He's 15, guys. Still 15. So they're waiting for the only other surviving family member, which would be Connor's older brother, to come in from Ruston, where he'd been attending college, and be present as an adult in the interview. However, Connor insists that he wants to speak with someone, but only one specific investigator. So they called... They got permission from the brother to conduct an interview without him being present. Who's although, that? who's who? Who's what investigator? Um, and the, why? He's actually the sheriff now of Concordia Parish, Sheriff Hedrick. He was the investigator for this one, and it was Investigator Hedrick at the time. Do you have any idea why he was? Um, I honestly don't know. It didn't say anything about it there. I couldn't find any kind of like pre existing relationship hmm. or anything. I'm not sure. But he was very insistent, and it may have just been that he had some kind of rapport going with him already. And, like, from the time he got to the police station, Mm. I'm not sure. Okay. So, they decided to go ahead and conduct an interview, but Connor did insist that he would feel more comfortable without any recording equipment. So, the investigator went ahead and agreed to that, and they had what they call a pre-interview that lasted about 35 minutes without being recorded. Um, And despite that, they did allow... The investigator to testify as to what was in that conversation and there were certain pieces that they asked him about and that wouldn't be considered considered hearsay no um that's basically up to the judge, judge's discretion so anytime you hear um they can always argue hearsay when it comes to police testimony or a police testifying yeah. about something that was said that wasn't recorded or because you can't tell me what you were exactly, told. Exactly, exactly. However, it's like a massive game of telephone that never ends well. Exactly. So, in the same manner as you know, you can ask the judge for 
Um, you can object to anything. The judge is at, it's at their discretion whether or not they decide it is or isn't. And even if it is, they can still say, I want to hear it or I want the jury to be able to hear it. I consider it to be reliable testimony and I'm going to allow it. Okay. Judge's discretion. So there were a couple things he testified to that Connor stated during the pre-interview. Um, and I'm not sure if I mentioned Matthew's name earlier. Um, the 16-year-old male teenager that they found laying face down in the hallway was Matthew Whittington. And he was actually Connor's best friend. Hmm. And because Connor was homeschooled, he didn't hang out with a lot of people. And we'll find out a little bit later that that was one of Connor's points of contention. But he only had a few friends and most of them went to another private school, not the one that they live next to, but another one that was in a, a group of families lived all in the same area, the quote unquote upscale area of Verity. So after the pre-interview that lasted about 35, 40 minutes wasn't recorded, Connor decided that he would give his first official recorded statement. And he stated that a few months ago, his parents were arguing a lot and he was dreading his dad coming home and he said, and the court document said on Wednesday nights and weekends, but from what I understand from all other sources, um, any of the news articles I read, anything at all said that he worked Monday through Friday. And that's also a source that was close to the case itself said his dad didn't normally come home in the middle of the week like that. It was a fluke. He said that his parents were arguing a lot. He was dreading his dad coming home. And when he told his best friend, Matthew Whittington, about it a couple weeks earlier, Matthew suggested that they kill them. Connor said he was shocked and didn't really say anything. But as time went by, Matthew brought it up more and more and became more serious. And Matthew would explain how they would do it. And the more Matthew talked about it, the more convinced Connor became that it was all right to mur murder his parents in cold blood. And then he started to want to do it. And they decided after about a month and a half that they would carry out these murders. Hmm. Everybody needs a friend as convincing as that. Right. They just need to have them on their side. Right. Right. Like, this is this was a good friend. Except... Mm. In these discussions, Matthew and Connor talked about how they knew of his truck getting broke into in previous weeks. And since then, John, who usually kept at least two guns in his truck, had started bringing these guns in from the truck to the house, Matthew, who had initially suggested that he brings guns from his own house, suggested that since John had been bringing the guns in from his truck, they could just use those. They get all the plans finalized as to how, what, and when, and Connor said that he called Matthew on Tuesday night, which would have been the 13th, and asked Matthew to come over, and that they were going to do it that night, meaning kill his parents. Matthew said, well, he would have to wait for his dad to go to sleep before he could sneak out because he's 16 years old. Matthew hung up with Connor, and a little while later, Connor called him back and asked Matthew, like, where are you at? He said, well, I'm about to leave. And then a few minutes later, I guess they lived in close enough proximity, which would make sense because, like I said, they were, he was homeschooled. And he was only friends basically with the people in his neighborhood or the kids in his neighborhood. So a few minutes later, they met up in Connor's backyard. Now, in this version, his first quote unquote official statement, Connor said that the initial plan was for him to shoot his parents. Matthew was going to break out the window and open the door to make it look like someone else had done it and then take the gun from Connor and leave with it. That way it would look like someone had come and left the scene and there would be no weapon to connect them to the crime. Almost smart. Pro tip, guys. If you're ever going to fake a burglary, break the window in from the outside. outside. Yes, but we're not giving anybody tips on how to burgle people. Of course not. That's not what we're that's doing. A, that's a clue on how you know that but, they didn't. But pro tip. Just crime scene, crime scene knowledge. Yeah, there yeah that one. That there one. we go. <laughs> <laughs> so. Do with it what you will. There we go. But according to Connor, when Matthew got to his house that night, he, Connor was having a change of heart. Not so much in the fact that he didn't want to kill his parents. He just didn't want to be the one to pull the trigger. So that's what he told Matthew. Matthew seemed a little upset at this and immediately balked and said, no, 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 we've been planning this for so long. And Connor said, whoa, whoa, slow your roll. I'm not saying not to do it. I just don't want to be the one to do it. And Matthew's like, oh, okay, cool, 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 cool. I'll do it. So they went inside together. Connor went into his room and sat there while Matthew got the gun from the kitchen and then went into Connor's parents' bedroom and started shooting. Go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to say, so he's convincing 
and he takes the initiative. Natural born qualities of a leader. There you go. There you go. Terrifying. Yeah. As Matthew started shooting, Connor started, quote, freaking out, unquote. And that is a literal direct quote, is what he said. <laughs> And his all of the court documents. Can I call bullshit or? Uh... Yeah, that's 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 what his words. This is, but you remember, when we're talking about this, we literally only have one actual story. One person walked out of that house alive. All we have otherwise is forensic evidence. The investigators at the scene, what the like, they can make the best guess that they can. The only story we have is Connor, and he has three different ones. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we're wonderful, going off of. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, one of them was the. The, well, what they're calling one story is the one that he gave the 911 operator. The two other stories are his two other official recorded statements. They're not even calling his pre-interview um, statement that he gave off the record an actual version because there's only parts and pieces of it that didn't match up and they don't have a recording of it. So they didn't actually say he had four. But technically, there were some discrepancies between all four times he's told. We'll go with three and a half. Happened. Three and a half is good with me. <laughs> So he's freaking out, and Connor said he could not believe, quote, what he had done, unquote. And then after shooting both parents, Matthew walked back into Connor's bedroom to say he was on his way to break the window, make it look like a break-in. And again, Connor said he started freaking out, and that's when he decided he was going to go. And he did, in fact, go down the hall and retrieve the gun he knew his mother kept under her mattress. So now we've got Matthew, who's retrieved a gun from the kitchen. And then Connor, who has gone into his mother's room to retrieve a gun where his parents were just shot to death. Interesting. So despite knowing that there has been a gun under the mattress the entire time, he chose to go the long way around and get the gun that he, his father kept in the truck. Well, if you think about it, he wouldn't want to go into his parents' bedroom, risk waking them up to get the gun. Mm. But what kind of throws me here is that he has no qualms about going into his parents who have just been shot to death into their bedroom to get a gun from underneath their dead bodies. Like, that kind of blew my mind a little bit. Takes a takes a, takes a, certain, a certain level of... Uh, uh, I say? Yeah. I, I, I couldn't find a better word than, like, stony-facedness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that worked. And so he goes and gets the gun from his mom's mat under his mom's mattress, and as he's coming back out of the room. So he sees Matthew in the hallway. They're face-to-face. -face. Connor said as he walked out of the hallway, Matthew was coming back to tell him that he was done and was about to leave. Connor says he just shot Matthew. He emptied the clip from the pistol and then ran to his room to call 911. Well, now that in and of itself doesn't actually strike me as odd. Most people that shoot a gun and are shooting a gun for the first time will empty the clip into the person that they're shooting at. Excellent. Out of pure e adrenaline, generally. Okay, excellent point. However, this kid, well, because when he was homeschooled, he didn't have a lot of, you know, uh, after school activities because he didn't go to school. But the main thing that he did to bond with his father and that his father was overly enthusiastic about, from what I understand, was hunting. He went hunting a lot. He killed a lot of animals. And the reason we know so much about this is because he kept photo albums, like a family photo album, but full of every single animal he ever killed. Hmm. Now, we know from earlier that Connor claims that he called 911 and said, there's an intruder and I've shot him and I think he's alive. Can I shoot him or can I kill him? And according to him, the operator said, yes, you can kill him. Hmm. But what he didn't mention to the operator was that he then went and got a second gun, a 22 caliber rifle, came back into the hallway and then shot Matthew twice in the back of the head with that gun. Interesting. So Connor said he was so, quote, freaked out, unquote, when the police arrived because he could not believe he had let Matthew kill his parents. And when asked why they did this, Connor said he really didn't know. <laughs> Mostly his reasoning surrounded around his relationship with his dad and said his dad was really downsizing to him. And those were his words when other people were around. And when the two of them were alone, things were fine. But when people were around, he would embarrass and make fun of him. He also stated that his mom limited what he could do, you know, being an actual parent hmm. and like who he could go out with. And now, but if you think about that in the terms. Probably should have limited uh, Matthew. Mm, I don't know. We'll see. Everything that I could gather, just knowing that the curriculum that they were using for his homeschooling and that they had used for his older brother was extremely, extremely borderline cultish and religion-based homeschooling curriculum. Hmm. 
Uh, he said his mom limited him to what he could do. He was not allowed to go anywhere with his friends, but he then said he would not have done it had it not been for Matthew convincing him that it was a good plan. So Connor also stated that he understood that you can overcome peer pressure and that he felt stupid for not doing so. <laughs> That was his first recorded statement with police. And despite the fact that the pre-interview wasn't recorded, they did allow the investigator to testify as to what it said. And there were a couple things he testified that Connor stated during the pre-interview that didn't match up with his official recorded statement. Oh, what a shock. Connor stated during the pre-interview that Matthew had retrieved the gun from the kitchen, which means that he left his room or they came inside together. Matthew was the one who got the guns that were supposedly taken out of his dad's truck and left in the kitchen. And then he also told the investigator that they had not sent emails or text messages about their plan and nobody else knew about it, trying to make it seem like they were way more crafty and, you know, like more criminally savvy or better than most premeditated murders I've ever heard of at 15 or 16. Um, But the, the most important one out of all of that was he said when the investigator testified, he said that Connor told him he shot Matthew out of anger or out of uh misguided revenge of some sort kind of yeah he was he was mad that matt had convinced him so he just got really angry all of a sudden and shot him Hmm. it's more like out of guilt i don't think he had any guilt but that's my personal opinion we'll get into that in a minute and connor was officially arrested and charged with three counts first degree murder at 12 40 that afternoon so it took them less than 10 hours to realize that this kid was full of shit and arrested him for all three murders and we'll be right back after a quick break Welcome back from the break, and we're going to fast forward three days to March 17th, 2007. The same in... Best fast forwarding noises. Actually, that sounds something like fast forwarding, and a VCR was so damn loud. I was thinking of time travel. Time travel's not real. (laughs) Most kids don't think VCRs are either. (laughs) (laughs) That's very true. Okay, so the, uh, the same investigator who had taken the first pre-interview statement and the second statement but officially the first statement received a call <laughs> received say time travel is not real <laughs> <laughs> so he received a call and it was connor he, and he wanted to speak with him about something important so this investigator returned to the facility where connor was being housed and connor stated that he wasn't completely being a hundred percent honest in his first recorded oh audio. what a shock so he said that everything was true up to a point. <laughs> and that point was when he started talking? <laughs> Actually, it was when Matthew showed up in the backyard. Hmm. So everything he said up to that point was true. And everything about them planning it all and Matthew being the ringleader and Matthew being the one to convince him. Hmm. He said in the second version, Connor told Matthew that he didn't want to do it at all. And Matthew asked, well, do you want me to kill them? And when Connor said, no, I really don't want them dead. But then Matthew continued to talk and they talked about it for a minute and then they went inside together. And then Matthew apparently picked up the gun from the kitchen and Connor said, no, 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 I don't want you to do it. And Matthew said, I'm not. And then they went to Connor's room. Matthew apparently still had the gun with him at that point. And they took the gun and themselves into Connor's room. And Matthew then sat down with Connor and got, you know, that serious look on his face and said, bruh. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Said, Matthew reminded Connor of all the things they'd been talking about, like why he wanted his parents dead and that his life would be so much better. And neither of them will get caught because their plan was perfect. Bruh. And then Connor, being convinced that Matthew was right, took the gun from Matthew and went into his parents' room and shot them. Connor has now gone into his parents' room and shot them. Connor went back to his room, tells Matt, I shot my parents, and then he gave Matthew the gun back because remember their plan was to make it look like somebody else had done it, so Matthew's got to take the gun, right? So wait, his second version is he pulled the trigger? Yes. His second version is that he told he, Matthew... He didn't want to do it. He didn't want to do it. He didn't want to do it. And then he did it. And then Matthew convinced him to do it. So he took the gun because he was convinced they were going to get away with it. So Matthew had convinced him it was a perfect plan. 
So he took the gun from Matthew, went and shot his own parents to death, and then gave that gun to Matthew to go break the window and make it look like somebody had broke in. Well, and all of this talk about perfect mm-hmm. plan. Yeah. And it, it very well could have been had he not said a damn thing in the first well, place. I'm going to blame this on frontal lobe development. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? Men develop their frontal lobe very early. Mm-hmm. Their lower frontal lobe. Mm-hmm, exactly. So Connor gives Matthew the gun and then Matthew went to break the window and finish their plan. Connor explained, quote, it was like I was somebody else. It felt like I didn't really just do that, and I wish I wouldn't have done it, and I just got so mad. I was just extremely mad at Matt because I feel like he had done it, unquote. So, yeah. But this is in the uh, the version. upscale version of, or ups, upscale region of uh-huh. Faraday? Oh, yeah. I just, got, I just fi- got real mad because I, I feel like he had done it. But he's 15 and he's homeschooled. What are you going to do? Uh, school better. So Connor then went and got the other gun from under his parents' mattress. Still he, having to reach under his dead parents. Still having to reach under his dead parents' bodies. That but part this, change. And this part, and even in, and in this version, that makes me even more sick to my stomach because he's the one who killed them. Like, it was bad enough when his parents were dead on the mattress and that he was getting a gun from under, but now he has shot and killed them. And... Me, yeah, He's the this. reason they're dead. And now, but, and, and see, this also doesn't follow. Why would he have given the gun to Matthew just for him to go break the window? And in my mind, and this is just speculation, Matthew used that sweater around his fist to break the window. That was why that hoodie was back by the back door to make it look like somebody had broken in that way. Yeah. So why would he even need the gun? Because he wasn't uh, leaving just then. Because he wasn't supposed to use the sweater because the sweater would have been evidence tying it to them. They're not that smart, baby, but they left it there anyway. I don't even think Connor knew whose sweater that was. I think he actually mentioned in one of the documents I read that he had no way he'd never seen that sort of before in his life. <laughs> so, like, of all the things that he could be denying, like, why would he deny that if he didn't, if he knew he actually knew whose sweater it was? Anyway, so it, it gets worse. Just out of a, a general sense of, I just want to lie about things. I, yeah, and that, that makes a lot of sense because the sky lies all over the place 100% of the time, sounds like. But also, um, you say you would you would blame this on uh, frontal lobe development. I think I would blame it more on uh, pride and or ego, which is a, a very common uh, character flaw in teenage males. Yes, but that's um, also frontal lobe development. Sh- okay, you see exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Connor went and got the gun from under his parents' dead bodies again, and, and then he meets not, not this, the second time not, he's gotten the gun. Yes, just the same in this the version. version. <laughs> so. He meets Matthew in the hallway, and at this point, he says Matthew probably didn't even realize, or he doesn't think that he realized, that he even had the gun. And then in his statement, Connor says, quote, And he was telling me, it's going to be better. Everything's all right. You've done it. It's over. Your life is going to be better. You know you're not going to have to deal with them anymore. And all of this, and I'm telling him, it's not going to be better. I just killed somebody. I didn't want to kill them. And he says... Matthew says, I promise it's going to be better. And I was just so mad at him, I just shot him. And then I called the cops. Unquote. Sounds like a whole lot of dumbassery. (sighs) It doesn't follow. In my head, it doesn't follow. None of it does. Um, It won't even more so later when I tell you more about Matthew and and his characteristics as a person. Enjoy. So, now three days after his... Y'all are in for a treat. Confusion galore. No, there's no real confusion. This one's so cut and dry. It just the confusion as to why and and how they got to that point maybe is more what I meant. My confusion comes in is when he, Connor. How did he believe this was going to make sense? How did he think he was going to get away with this? Is my question. If he just stayed shut up. But see, that's the thing is that I think in his mind he felt like he could get away with it if he made it sound like it was somebody else's fault. Yeah, no, that's just, that's straight delusion. Yeah. If he had just literally never said a damn word about it. Right. It's entirely possible he could have. He could have up and left and said he wasn't home when it happened. And he didn't know what happened. Oh, and what you mean, though, if he had left completely. Yeah. Like, where would he have gone, though? Because he's homeschooled and he doesn't live anywhere else. There's no other family in the area except for his I'm brother. I'm not saying it was a good plan. I'm just saying he could have gotten away with it. My whole thing. Don't be schwack. Don't schwack me. 
Um, and and this was it's a good point that you brought up. If he had just kept his mouth shut, um, I couldn't find anywhere in anything that I read that he had an attorney present. I know we didn't have one for the first one, but three days later, he should have, or at least had a an adult present, which I don't know if he did or didn't. I I couldn't find that information unless he was still uh, talking to the same investigator. He was. It was the same investigator. So then- they wouldn't have pressed him to get an attorney because he'd already given his consent to be with that investigator without one. Maybe, but I would have argued that in court. But I'm, I'm sure his lawyer did. I just, I was just making what the point of he, he eventually hires a lawyer. Ah. You also or a lawyer to his brother in Rustin. His brother made it there eventually, but um, at, at the, it was less than ten hours from the time that he called the cops to the time that he was arrested, and they kept him in police custody. As far as I know, they kept him in police custody the entire time. Yes. Yeah, it's a two-hour trip, and if you're if you're going quick, it's an hour and a half. So, just three days after his initial recorded statement, his story went from him and Matt planned the whole thing. Matt came over. He chickened out of shooting, but still wanted it done. So, Matt said he would do the shooting. Matt went and shot his parents. He freaked out, then shot Matt. Then to the second version, where Matt was already over, and and he said he he said he didn't want to do it, but Matt was very convincing and convinced him. That it needed to be done, so he went and did it, and then, with no quote, freaked out and uh, killed Matt after killing his parents, all while trying to say that he didn't want to do it in the first place at all, but that hit Matt was extremely convincing. Exactly. The one thing that Connor stuck with through all of his interviews, recorded, not recorded, was that Matt came up with the idea in the fir- first place. He made all the plans. He would talk about it most and all the time. And he said that he, Connor, would just listen and didn't really have anything to say. Hmm. Because that's how conversations go. About killing someone else's parents. Yeah. Right. Right. Because Matthew had all the reason to be upset with Connor's parents, not Connor. Right. Right. So Hmm. when the investigators asked him how many times he shot his parents, Connor said he didn't know. (laughs) He remembered changing magazines, but he couldn't remember if he shot his parents after that. He said he did not wear any gloves when he shot the pistol, and he told Hold the end. Do you know how many times his parents were shot? Yes. How many? I'm getting there. No, I, I'm curious because he changed magazines. Yes. In the middle of shooting them. Yes. That's a lot of rage. Yes. We'll get there. Okay. Carry on. Okay. Well, we're getting close. We're getting close to there. So. He said he did not wear any gloves when he shot the pistol. He told the investigator that the gun he retrieved from his parents' mattress was a black pistol, and he said he thought Matthew fell face down after the first two or three shots, and then he just emptied the clip into Matthew. He said he turned off the light, or he turned on the light in the hall or his bedroom, or both, and then he saw that Matthew was still moving. After the 911 operator told him that he could kill the quote-unquote intruder, that he got the 22 rifle out of his parents' closet and shot Matthew in the back of the head once, which does not line up with what the autopsy said. And so he said then that he went outside to, he got his father's truck keys and went outside to his father's truck. Um, it doesn't really make it clear as to why he did this. Um, I think this was a slip in his um, telling of his story because I think at this point he was trying to cover his bases, and so he had to make a point to say he went out to the truck, which is why his um, the blood or whatever it was would be in the truck if they found any, because he had already shot them, and he was trying to retrieve another gun to make it look like his plan that he was forming in his mind made sense. That's the only reason I can figure that he mentioned going out to the truck, because if you remember earlier, he specifically stated that Matt and he had already been brought in. They had been brought in, so why would he be going out to the truck? other than to retrieve the gun that was in the truck to make it look like the story that he was about to tell them. Possible. Also possible that the father brought in the handguns that were easy to steal and left the rifle in the truck. Well, the, the way that it uh, read, it said that he got it out of his parents' closet. That's what he said. Oh, I just misheard that then. Okay, yeah. That He just said he got it out of his parents' closet, which, again, we can't really believe anything out of this kid's mouth. So Fair. then he said that he didn't know if Matt had gloves on. But he stated he didn't give him any. Testimony later given from a friend of both Connor and Matthew stated that the neoprene gloves found on Matthew's body were the same as gloves he had seen Connor wearing when they were hunting in the 2006-2007 hunting season. And he explained he recognized them so well because they are so thin, which is usually not the case with hunting gloves because you're 
freezing usually, but neoprene gloves, I guess, would yeah, keep you warm and be thin and maneuverable. Uh, not as much. They're more for you wear them under a thicker pair of gloves and they waterproof you. Oh, okay. That makes that sense. That way, when your other gloves get wet, uh, you still have full maneuverability of your fingers. Okay, cool. That's good to know. Um, we heat, wear yeah. them a lot when we're working um, on water lines. Um, that makes sense. Or in the mud. Yeah. That way our, our gloves can get crap and we still have the grip of the glove on the other glove. Right. And we so we don't lose our grip. Okay. <clears throat> so, again, the investigator asked Connor what made him kill his parents. And he stated that he started off talking to Matthew about his parents fighting all the time. And that Matthew was spending the night at his house on Monday night preceding the murders. And brought up the plan on Tuesday after he had gone home. Because I guess he had heard their parents arguing or whatever and so that's when Matthew came up with the plan but it, again my speculation is just that Connor came up with the idea to kill his parents at that point and decided to bring Matthew into it somehow and although Connor kept saying that they've been talking about this for months there was a complete review of phone records computer records um <laughs> get this emails MySpace and Facebook hmm. accounts it revealed no information regarding the existence of a one and a half or any month or any length of time conspiracy only the phone calls that were made the night of March 13th the Tuesday and the morning of the 14th the, the morning that they were murdered and that was one call from Matthew's cell phone to Connor for about one minute at 108 another call from Connor to Matthew at 109 and then information later recovered from Connor's cell phone indicated that Matthew called him at about 1.11 and they talked for almost an hour, about 49 minutes. And then again at 2.17, Connor called Matthew and they talked for an undetermined amount of time. So basically this long formative plan that Connor is saying that he and Matthew came up with for months and months and that Matthew was basically the ringleader of, there was absolutely no evidence of that. And we're going to take a quick break real quick and we'll be right back. Welcome back from the break. Now, let's get into the trial and the forensic findings presented in court testimony. The reason we're even able to tell this story or be talking about this at all today, and it wasn't completely sealed records and there are news articles and things about it with names specific, was because Connor was tried as an adult due to the egregious nature of the crimes and extreme disregard for human life. Even though the crimes were committed when he was just 15, the grand jury indicted him as an adult on May 7th 2007 for the murder of his parents and his alleged co-conspirator slash best friend and they found a true bill with the charges of first degree murder what when you go to a grand jury it's not the same as going to trial so you're not found guilty or not guilty they have to find a true bill or not a true bill and what that means is that the prosecution can then go forward with charges and usually they only convene a grand jury for um, major crimes, which would be okay. first degree, second degree. So essentially, it's a, it's a check and balance, just as as a whether or not they have enough evidence. A, yeah, a checkpoint of will this pass in a jury trial? Right. Do they have enough evidence to go forth with a jury trial, or even a judge trial, depending yeah. on what the defense wants? Well, yeah, to do. either way. Yeah. But just a, do we have enough evidence to actually bring this to trial and get a, and get our conviction? But my point was not that they needed to bring it to a grand jury, but only that even bring it up at all until they had enough. Absolutely, absolutely correct. Because a pro- uh, the a district pro- attorney's office is not going to go in there looking like a fool. Yeah, they're not. They're not even gonna, going to attempt uh, a case without thinking that they can get a conviction. Absolutely. That Absolutely. was that was my only point. Most on that. most of the time, a district attorney is not going to present it to the grand jury without having that evidence, like you said. So they found a true bill with three charges of first degree murder, but they were then amended by the state in March 2008 to charge the defendant with three counts of second degree murder instead because according to an article by the Concordia Sentinel the district attorney said I can't get 12 people to agree on the color of my tie much less on a first degree murder conviction and that's relevant because in Louisiana in 2007 and all the way up until I believe it was 2016 they had to have 12 out of 12 a unanimous verdict for a first degree murder conviction but for a second degree murder you only had to have 10 out of 12 but they that's changed since then but at that point it was still just 10 out of 12 for second degree murder and a majority vote is a lot easier to get than unanimous yes although in this case it was unanimous 
all 12 jurors voted yes for second degree murder. So in the end, it didn't matter too much, but no one knows for sure. They may not have all 12 agreed that it was a first degree. Right. So the district attorney made the right call on this one. So in March 2008, uh, almost a full year after the triple murder of his parents and his best friend, Connor Lane Wood went on trial. One of the more notable testimonies was given by Dr. Karen Moss, a forensic pathologist and assistant coroner of the Jefferson Parish Coroner's Office. She found many interesting things of note. According to court documents, there were two 22 caliber shell casings found beside Matthew's body, as well as seven 32 caliber shell casings. There were two other casings of 32 caliber bullets found in the bathroom right off of the hallway and the rest were found in the parents' bedroom. Dr. Karen Ross testified that Matt received a gunshot wound to the face um, that traveled from his nose to the base of his skull. Which, interestingly enough, was the only wound he actually got from the front. That's true. Yes, the only one from the front was that first shot. And there was a presence of stippling, which, do you know what stippling is? Uh, Meaning that it was shot between one and a half to three feet away. You're very knowledgeable on this subject. It's almost like you've heard it before. No, just know about guns. Okay, okay. (laughs) So you're correct. The Dr. Ross actually testified that this gun, the gun that shot the first bullet, had to have been within three feet of taking the shot because of the presence of stippling. So, um... The next two that she notes were the two 22 caliber bullet, or she says small caliber, we can assume, um, that those two were made on the back of his head. Bullet wounds four and five were likely made while Matthew was bending over and entered from the back, likely also a 32 caliber. The sixth through the ninth bullet wounds were in his buttock region, left and right, and were all made with the medium or 32 caliber. Basically, all the all but the first shot was from the back. And that indicates that Connor shot Matthew in the face and after or as he was falling, continued to shoot with the 32 caliber pistol seven more times and finished him off with the rifle with two more shots to the side back side of his head. Now, the two 32 caliber cartridges that were found in the bathroom kind of throw me off a little, but I think those were just I, I, perhaps the first shot and then another maybe the graze wound possibly um and and then he fired because that would have made it how many how many rounds are in a in the cartridge of because i think they mentioned the gun the 32 um it was a uh, 7.65 millimeter model d mab pistol uh it has a nine round mag if you're talking about a 32 it can also fit a 380 but that would only have a seven round mag i believe Okay, so they determined that these were 32 because I, I know that further in here in a second, they talk about them matching the 32 caliber um, bullet from recovered from the body itself um, were actually matched to the weapon. So it was 32 millimeter that they that he was using. Yes, at least 32 at least a, caliber, whatever. At least a few of the bullets were definitively said to have been to have come from a to have come from the 32 caliber gun yeah, found in the home. Okay, but if it's a nine-round magazine, then he could have had one in the chamber, so that means the one extra casing they found in the bathroom could have possibly been the graze wound that he had on the... But there wasn't one extra casing. There were only nine casings found. There were nine shots fired. Okay. So... The the extra was the nine mil. The mystery continues. Um, So there were the two caliber... Two 32 caliber cartridges found in the bathroom, and then seven were found next to... Matthew's body. Matthew's body. Those were all determined, forensically determined to be, to have had come from the 7.65 Model D MAB, like we said. Um, the six bullets that were in Matthew's body were forensically determined to have come from this weapon as well. And there was only one that was retrieved that was not able to be 100% confirmed to have come from that weapon. Um, the two other bullets, which were the small caliber bullets, they were determined to have the same characteristics as the Ruger 22 rifle. But due to the damage of the bullets after they entered the skull, they weren't conclusively determined to have come from the weapon. Now, moving on to the bodies of Connor's parents, Mr. John and Mrs. Jerry, they were found in their bed, naked, under a comforter, with multiple 9mm casings found throughout the room, 
and an empty 9mm magazine lying on the floor between the night table and the bed. So they found 9mm casings and they found an empty magazine. And the court document that I found online that is mostly uh, the appeal that I found online says that Dr. Karen Moss stated that there were 12 bullet wounds on Jerry's body. No, not not necessarily. There were 12 injury wounds. There were 12 total bullets that hit her. Okay. Um, I find that interesting because they're, the 9mm that she's using, the Jimenez Arms uh, 9mm, has a 12-round clip. There were 13 fired and 12 hit her. Eight, maybe not another eight, but eight total hit. That was his name? John. John. <laughs> so... That, the reason that that's in, interesting to me, though, is because a lot of the reports that I read and there were news articles, multiple news articles that I read, and I can link those in the show notes, they all said that they each had been shot five times. And that was, I guess, what they were hearing either in court, but the appeal itself was what I got this information from. And it says 12 wounds and eight wounds. Yes. So, um, and that was. And then there were how many case? How many bullet casings did they find? You said it was twelve total casings, or was that just for the nine mil? Yeah, thirteen. There were thirteen to so the one in the chamber and the twelve in the magazine. Mm-hmm. And because and there was the empty magazine found, got it. Because he said that he had changed magazines, but he couldn't remember if he had fired. That's anything right. From it. He did. That was in whatever version that he told. I don't remember which story version that was. The first, second, third, fourth, fifth, twelfth. But it follows um, nonetheless because they found the gun with a. Almost fresh magazine in it. That's right. Or the an almost person full in the house. magazine in it uh, with one in the chamber as well. Right, right. Jerry had been shot at least five times. Bullets that went through her went into her husband as well. It's unclear the actual amount, but we know that there were at least 13 bullets shot. My personal theory on this one is that it was all bluster and he didn't have any... In any uh, animosity towards his father, at least not not any particular animosity. Well, it doesn't seem like it. And that he shot all 12 of these bullets into his mother, and some of them happened to go through her into him. Well, especially he didn't have to shoot his father because of the because of the through and throughs. Right, and that's that's what I was about to say. The but nine all of the anger was powerful. directed at his mother. The, yes, I, I can agree with that because you know, in in all other cases of true crime cases that I've ever listened to. The solo suspect will always take out the largest threat first. And so in my mind, that would mean he would shoot his father first, knowing that his father might be able to get up and fight him. Um, And so this just seemed like something that was almost completely backwards. And so there has to be some other mitigating factor there for him to have taken out and shot her as many times as he did hoping and praying, which I mean, obviously the the bullets went through both and nine millimeter is strong enough, not like a twenty two. 9mm will go through and through and keep going because it does have that amount of power and that amount of weight to it. The cause of death for both were obviously the multiple gunshot wounds and the manner of death was ruled as a homicide. Now, there were no latent fingerprints detected on any of the weapons recovered from the scene. Any of the magazines, any of the cartridges, any of the bullets. Nothing. None of those had any kind of fingerprints on them, which is interesting because Connor... When the police first showed up, and I don't think I said this at the beginning, but when the police first got there, they said he was kind of amped up and he looked like he had something on his mind. But he also, as the police were entering the house, he also made a spontaneous utterance that, oh, my my fingerprints are going to be all over the guns because we went hunting recently. Um, which is funny and weird in my mind because he said that, but then they found zero fingerprints on anything, zero at all. Which, if they hadn't been used that night, would actually make sense to me. Because after you go hunting, you typically are going to clean your guns thoroughly. Right. Um, so there wouldn't... Well, at least avid hunters would. I would Absolutely. I would, think, I would think they would. Um, they, they better. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, so it, it would make sense for his fingerprints not to be on any of them, actually. Except for the fact that they were all used that night. Right. And used... In, in uh, there was so much that went on. Like you think about the fact that he emptied the clip in both weapons. We know for sure that he emptied the nine millimeter, or somebody quote unquote emptied the nine millimeter and then ejected a car, a magazine, put a magazine back in it, and racked a bullet. 
So, I mean, all of those things that you're, you're touching all kinds of surfaces, something would have been on there. And no now, gloves were found. Um, except for on Matthew's except body. Except for on Matthew's body. So it's just, it's weird, but also... So it's possible staging to the, to the extent of taking his gloves off of him and putting them on Matthew, especially seeing as how those gloves were uh, noted that they had been seen on, on Connor in the 2006-2007 hunting season. Mm-hmm. In, that, in that year, that, the year before. So it's entirely possible that Matthew didn't touch a single gun, that he was a scapegoat from the beginning. Very possible, very likely. Like where your, like where your head's at. <laughs> so... Poor Matthew. Yeah, poor Matthew, and that's that's why I told you earlier to like hold that thought because maybe Matthew wasn't such a bad friend. Maybe Matthew was just trying to be there for his friend. Came over, and this is what he walked into. Yeah. We don't know anything for sure. <laughs> so, uh, aside from the guns, there was only one other latent fingerprint discovered at the scene. Sorry, not one toy story. But upon trying to be lifted, it was unable to be used for identification. So. And again, with latent fingerprints, they're not a perfect science. I mean, you can have parcels and things that you can't get a full read on. So there may have been parcels on the gun, but we don't have any evidence or documentation to support that. No latent prints of value could be detected on the gun, the magazine, the cartridges, the second empty magazine casings, the empty magazine found in the bedroom, the other gun, the other magazine, the other gun, or the three boxes of various types of ammunition found in the room. Not a single print of value. Of value. And a lot of times in cases where things are so heavily handled by multiple people, like in a household, they'll be too smudged by too many different prints with too many different ridge patterns to be able to be discernible. So Connor Wood sat in the courtroom with his private attorney who, when it was the defense's turn to present a case, He called no witnesses, and he did not have Connor take the stand, which is standard practice. And that, you know, possibly could have worked, except for the fact that the judge had already ruled that all of Connor's tape confessions and the testimony from the officer that did the pre-interview was going to be allowed. And basically, from that point, there wasn't really any good defense. So Connor stood before before the judge and the jury, and after a lengthy trial, and when the jury was out, they only took 25 minutes, 25 minutes of deliberations, and they came back. What do you think their verdict was? Guilty. Guilty. He was found guilty of all three counts of second degree murder. Subsequently? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was subsequently sentenced a month later in April of 2008 to three consecutive life sentences at hard labor without the benefit of parole, probation, or suspension of sentence. So what's the difference between consecutive and concurrent here? Consecutive means one after the other, and concurrent means running together. That's right! So after he finishes his first life sentence, he gets another one. And then another one after that. The majority of the information that I got for this case came from the defendant's own appeal on caselaw.finelaw.com. And in this appeal, it was presented and then decided on June 3rd of 2009 that his conviction was affirmed. And the Third Circuit Court found that he failed to meet his burden of proving that the sentences imposed upon him were constitutionally excessive because, quote, given the senselessness of the three murders, we cannot say that the imposition of three consecutive life sentences at hard labor without benefits is grossly disproportionate to the offenses committed by the defendant, unquote. So in layman's terms, he got what he deserved. But it wasn't quite finished. In 2018, he did get another chance to be heard back in the courtroom again a full decade later after he had been convicted. Due to new legislation passed by the Supreme Court about juvenile offenders being sentenced to life without parole terms. And they had to review all the cases that qualified. But, again, his sentence was affirmed and he continues to be located to this day at the Angola, Louisiana State Penitentiary, according to the Louisiana Inmate Search website. Uh, On that topic is if there is a juvenile offender found to be guilty and is sentenced to life in prison uh, after only 25 years of their sentencing, juvenile offender, juvenile lifers after 25 years get a parole hearing. Automatically. Automatically. They get a they get a review automatically because of their age at the time of their sentencing. And I understand the whole frontal lobe bullshit. It's fact. But like scientific, I don't, and I understand that some of these pro hearings can be, can essentially be concluded with no, 
Yeah, basically, <laughs> basically that's how, especially in, in a case like this where he brutally murdered his parents and then killed his best friend to blame for it. But I just find that fascinating that, was it carte, carte blanche, every single one of them after 25 years gets another chance. Yeah, and that was part of the legislation that was passed that got his case back in a courtroom to be reviewed. So, and that went retrograde. So that went back to all of the ones when in the states, in the Supreme Court, when this passed, all of the states had to do this with their juvenile cases that had been sentenced to life. to say, when that was passed, there was a lot of uh, backlog hearings. Yeah. And every courtroom ever, everywhere was yeah. fucking big. That's right. So he <laughs> he is currently housed in Angola still to this day. He's been there. Not s- Angola, Africa. Not Angola, Africa, baby. That's the state penitentiary. And he's been there since June of 2011. So basically, as soon as he turned 18, they transferred him to Angola. He's 31 years old today. Matthew Whittington would have been 32. John would have been 58. And Jerry would have been 56. And regardless of what these victims did while they were alive, whether the mother was too harsh or the father and her were always arguing or whatever it was. And Matthew was just an innocent None of them deserve what happened to them, and they are missed by their family and friends dearly. A uh, couple things, just my <laughs> personal opinion. I think, and this is just my opinion and speculation, Uh-oh. I have no proof of this, but in my opinion, I think he planned and staged this entire event insane. I think he called the sheriff's office and said those things to the operator to give himself some form of justification backed by this call. And got the gun out of the truck the nine millimeter uh, or after you know that he got the, the gun out of the truck made up the story about the, the break-in because there was no proof of that anywhere that i could find that the, the that had even been uh reported prior to this event happening and i think that he convinced matthew to sneak over to his house so that he could blame him fully for it and i thought that he he believed he was going to get away with it And I truly believe that he's exactly where he belongs. And I want to say thank you for listening. And if you like the show, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or whichever platform you're listening on, if you can. And if you have any questions for us or just want to let us know what you think or to let us know about a case you would like us to research and cover, please send us an email. And I'll link that email in the show notes. And we'll see you next time. Take care out there. This has been an Elf Audio production.